In this lecture, we're going to start line integrals of vector fields. In order to do this calculation, we need two main objects. We need a parametrization of a curve C in our domain, either R2 or R3, where we have to have a clear sense of direction. So we need to have a starting point and an ending point for our curve. We also need a background vector field. We can think of it like an electromagnetic field. Ultimately, the motivation here is to compute the work the vector field does moving an object along this path, which means that if we imagine moving along this path, what we would like to get a feel for, what we'd ultimately like to kind of sum up, is a bunch of calculations that look like force dot displacement. So here, by displacement, we mean displacement as we travel along this path. Now the path here is bending, so this isn't going to be just one dot product. In order to estimate the work done along this curve, by computing f dot d along the curve, what we imagine doing is chopping up our curve. Okay, I didn't chop this up very finely on purpose. Then the displacement along this first piece is approximately the displacement along the straight line segment, which I should actually draw here as a vector. So we will approximate displacement with these vectors. And then for force, what we'll do is we'll just pick a representative point for each segment and compute the force there. So for example, if I'm going to use this one force vector to approximate the force across the ith segment in my chopping, I could call that f evaluated at xi star, yi star. So at the point I've chosen to represent this segment, whatever the x and y coordinates are, I would just plug that into the vector field. Now the work done by this vector field moving an object along this path, we can approximate by adding up the work done across each of these segments, where we have one choice of force for each segment and the straight displacement vector. So we can say the work is approximately the sum from i equals one through the number of slices we made of f evaluated at the representative point dot the displacement, which I've drawn here as these orange vectors. Now notice the displacement goes from the beginning of the segment to the end. So we would do end point minus beginning point to come up with the vector description here. So that would be ri minus ri minus one. So this first vector is r1, that's like the curve point at that first chop minus the initial point, r0, r2 minus r1, r3 minus r2, etc. So this is a vector difference giving us a displacement vector. We denote this vector difference with delta r, where the r has a little vector symbol over it because here we're talking about a difference along this parametrized path. So this gives us the general form for a vector line integral, which is the integral of the vector field f over the curve c dot dr. I use dr. In some sources, that would be ds, where it's an s with the vector symbol to not confuse it with the arc length. I think of this as a very symbolic expression. Looking at it, it's not clear how you would compute it based on what's written but we can present this calculation differently that does lend itself to computation. So the next form would be to take the sum and let me call xi star yi star, let's just call that r of ti star. In other words, we're evaluating the force at some representative point along the curve, this time described as a special t value rather than a special xy value. And then I'm gonna take my vector difference and divide it by a change in t, but also multiply it by a change in t so that I'm not actually changing the quantity. Notice the denominator ti minus ti minus one is the same thing as the change in t. So those two expressions would cancel each other out and return us back what we started with. But in this form, 
I'm viewing everything as a function of t. So here it's like I'm chopping up with respect to the parameter t. And this leads to a much more computationally useful form, which is the integral from a to b of f of r of t dot r prime of t dt. So in other words, we're going to take our vector field, evaluate it on the parametrized path, dot it with the velocity vector. Where did that come from? It came from the change in r divided by the change in t. So this is difference in outputs divided by difference in inputs. And now we're integrating with respect to t. So this is my favorite way to compute a vector line integral. It's what we're going to do in the examples in this lecture. Given our path, we find a parametrization, r of t, evaluate our vector field along it, dot it with the velocity vector. After you've done that, you've taken a dot product, so it's a scalar. So actually, this should lead to a scalar expression that you then anti-differentiate with respect to t and plug in your bounds. But we're not done, because there's yet another presentation for vector line integrals I want to mention. And it comes from the relationship between arc length and speed. So recall the relationship between the differentials ds and dt. Since the derivative of the arc length function is the speed, we say that ds is the speed times dt. So using that relationship, the other presentation for vector line integral would be to take the sum of f, and I'm just going to write f this time, dot. Now looking above, let me do the same difference quotient relating r and t. So ri minus ri minus 1. divided by, this time I'll write it, delta t. And then where I had delta t, I'm going to write delta s divided by the speed. That comes from the relationship on the left. But as we chop up finer and finer, if the sum converges, we expect this expression to go to the velocity. So we're taking the velocity and we're dividing it by the speed. That's actually going to be generating that unit tangent vector t hat. So this leads to the third form that we see for vector line integrals, which is to say that we're going to integrate over the curve C f dot t hat ds. Not s with a vector symbol. This is ds, where s is the arc length parameter. And what this actually creates is a scalar expression because it's, again, a dot product. So this would be a scalar expression ds the reason for this third presentation is to make it look like a scalar line integral. So like before we had f ds, this would be the function little f. So this is the function ds over c. t hat, of course, is independent of the parametrization as long as we're traveling in the correct direction. At every point on this curve, we would sketch the unit tangent vector. So that doesn't depend on having one particular parametrization. That's why I left r out of this expression. Let's talk about what we expect from this work computation, the vector line integral of f along a path. If the force and the displacement are mostly pointing in the same direction, say the angle opened up between them is less than 90 degrees, then f dot d would be positive because cosine of theta would be a positive number. So we would expect our computation to be positive we would compute positive work done. If, however, our force mostly works against the path, or the path is flowing against the force, so that f and d are mostly pointing in opposite directions, say the angle opened up between them is more than 90 degrees, then the cosine of that angle would be negative, so f dot d would be a negative computation. If our curve is mostly flowing in the same direction as the vector field, f dot d is positive. If our curve is mostly flowing against the vector field, f dot d is negative. So in these two pictures here, I have the same background vector field and the same curve c, but parametrized in opposite directions. What would we expect the sign of the vector line integral of f along c according to the given parametrizations to be? Well, in this parametrization, we're mostly flowing in the same direction as the vector field. So if we were to compute this vector line integral, we would expect to get a positive answer. In the second picture, 
if I flow right to left, we're mostly moving against the vector field, or the vector field is working against the motion. So our vector line integral in this case will be negative. Let's look at two more examples. Okay, in this picture, as I flow from the top to the bottom, I actually set this one up so that the curve is always perpendicular to the vector field. So this line integral is zero. Okay, and then the picture on the right is less obvious. For this one, we've got a little mixture of behaviors going on, so we just do the best we can. Let's see, here we're moving with it. Right, so if I'm traveling in this direction, when I start, the path is flowing in the same direction as the vector field, but then we're moving against it, and then we're kind of perpendicular, and then we're with it, we're flowing in the same direction, and then looks like mostly perpendicular. I would say overall this is probably positive, just based on an eyeball inspection. Okay, now let's do some computational examples. Let f be a vector field in R2, given by f of x and y equals x comma y, and let C be the curve parametrized by R of t equals cosine of t sine of t for t going from zero to two pi. In other words, we're gonna go once counterclockwise around the unit circle. Compute the vector line integral f dot dr along this curve. In other words, compute the work this force does moving a particle along this path. I have pretty much the same four steps that I have with scalar line integrals. The first step is to identify the parametrization, which is given to us, but sometimes, of course, we'd have to come up with it ourselves. Anytime you have to come up with it yourself, you have to make sure you're flowing in the right direction. As we saw in the visual examples from a second ago, direction is important when you're doing vector line integrals. Okay, next let's evaluate our vector field on this path. So we'll do f of r of t. So that's like f of cosine of t sine of t. Our vector field is f of x and y equals x, y, so it just returns you back what you plugged into it. So this would take us to the vector cosine t sine t. Next, we're gonna compute the velocity vector r prime of t. Okay, just differentiate component by component, we get negative sine of t cosine of t. Now my fourth step is to set up and evaluate the integral. Okay, so our vector line integral is gonna be the integral from zero to two pi of f of r of t dot r prime of t dt. So it's two dot three dt. Okay, so that's gonna be cosine t sine t dot negative sine t cosine t. You do that dot product though and you get zero. So overall the answer is zero. There was zero work done. That shouldn't surprise you if you pictured what this vector field and the curve looked like before we began. So here's a picture of the vector field together with the curve superimposed. Notice the vector field points radially outwards and our curve is the circle. So at every point, our velocity vector r prime is perpendicular to the vector field. Okay, let's finish with this example. We have the same curve, but this time our vector field is f of x and y equals negative y x. So the first step is the same. For the second step, we're gonna evaluate f along our path. This time f is negative y x, so that's gonna be negative sine t cosine t. Same path as before, so we have the same velocity vector, negative sine t cosine t. So we're ready to set up and solve this vector line integral. It's gonna be the integral from zero to two pi of f of r of t dot the velocity vector dt. Okay, this time though, the answer is gonna be different. So we're gonna integrate from zero to two pi, negative sine t cosine t dot negative sine t cosine t dt. That's gonna give us sine squared plus cosine squared, which is one. So we're gonna integrate from zero to two pi, one dt. So this time the answer is two pi. Here's a picture of this vector field together with the curve. And this time you can see that our vector field and our curve are always pointing in the same direction. So as expected, the vector line integral was positive. Okay, I'll stop this discussion here, but we're gonna keep working with vector line integrals. Thank you for your attention.